Welcome to the media ministry of Lake Highlands Church. Our speaker today is the senior pastor, Dr. Jim Reynolds. This is an interesting moment to uh, be talking uh, to the church. Uh, I might call it without being some final conversations as the father of the church with this church. And so, uh, I want to go deep with you and speak plainly, truthfully about life and about moving on to uh, through a season of life. I think we're always going through a season of life. Just every now and then it hits me, I'm, yeah, I'm going through something here. I'm going through a passage. And it hits us maybe years after we're already doing it, but it certainly hits us now about this church. Uh, last year, I climbed a 14er and with my family, and they kind of, I had to do it one more time. <laughs> and when I started the climb, I was walking too fast. You start at 11,500 on Handy's Peak, and that's kind of high. And man, I'm dying. I mean, it's like, I cannot stay up with all you people. You know, you're like 15 or 13, whatever it is you are. And that's ridiculous how being that young. Uh, so at a certain break, my, my daughter in love, uh, Dan, is sucking air just like I am. I said, you know, we've got to do this differently. We can't do this like the rest of these people. And I'm going to, she says, I'm not feeling good either. And I said, well, I'm not going to make it at this pace. So I want you just to do your little pace and I'm going to get right behind you. And we're just going to be these two tortoises, if that's a word. <laughs> we're going to get there. And these other people have gone up to the mountain and they're running back and saying all kinds of stuff and we just keep going. And I think sometimes a church has to say, hey, let's slow down. Let's pray. We don't know what we're doing here. We have to do that. I'd have died up there going that pace. My tombstone would be up there. Handy's Peak. He died in Handy's Peak because he was too stupid to slow down. I didn't want to do that. My body told me I couldn't do that. But sometimes anxiety drives us more than faith. Today, I just want to tell you that unity and prayer are everything. Connecting with God and living as in united. And that means united when you don't agree with each other. That's when unity, you know, other than that, it's uniformity. I'm talking about churches that are not uniform. We got multiple differences here about lots of stuff. But Jesus Christ is Lord. We got a class beginning September the 10th that Bill Borland's going to lead just on praying for the church. We got a couple of other great classes that, but praying for the church starting next month. Because life is about relationships, passages, and relationships forever. But if the relationships break down, then the passage you're going through breaks down. Whether you're 15 years old, 50 years old, or 75 years old. So prayer connects us with relationship with God powerfully as we go through the passage. The challenge, the challenge of churches going through transitions is everywhere in Scripture. The church has always been on the way, but has never arrived. It begins with the bondages that we were in, and then the liberation from the bondage. Think of Israel in Egypt, delivered out into the wilderness. Bondage, liberation, purposeful journeying in the wilderness. And the wilderness is a dangerous place where God provides. Our culture is dangerous. It's toxic. But, the, but we live in that wilderness. It's a dangerous place where God provides. Israel is walking through a wilderness after a deliverance. We've been delivered here by the, by the powers of Jesus Christ, liberated from bondage for purposeful journeying in the wilderness. 
toward completion of a mission. The opposite of that, and we emphasize being born again, but I want to, we got to do more than that. You don't want your, the day you were born again to be the best day of your life. It's about purposeful journeying toward mission and toward completion for Israel then, for the church now. I'm going to talk just this morning a few minutes about Israel as she passed through her journey on the way, and the church in First Peter, a church, a little, these churches that Peter's talking to in AD 64, 35 years after Jesus, he's talking to them about moving through their season. But let's first look at Israel, Numbers chapter 11, 4 to 6, if we have that in the NIV. This is an astounding little three verses here. Now, this is like three or four months after they've been delivered from Egypt. And they're out in the wilderness, and there's not any food out there. So they're going to starve to death. So he gives them manna. Imagine every day manna comes out of heaven and feeds you. Well, because of the state of Israel, because the church is where the church was, things weren't going well. Let's read this. The rabble with them began to crave other food. They were not happy with manna from heaven. (laughs) That's kind of astounding to begin with. So they started wailing and said, if we only had meat to eat, we've got to have some meat. We remember the fish we ate in Egypt, how great it was, at no cost. I don't think the manna was costing them anything either. (laughs) Also, this is what really goes to the kind of the trivial to the ridiculous. Also, the cucumbers. And I like cucumbers, but come on. Leeks, onions, and garlic. Man, we have lost our appetite out here. We've lost it. We never see anything but this manna from heaven. Really? That's a problem. Yes, it does not appeal to my taste. After all, everything is about my taste. God's provision does not pass the taste test. But you look a little closer. I looked in numbers. It's no wonder it doesn't pass the taste test because the word prayer does not appear in numbers. 36 chapters, they didn't pray. They had no taste for God. 1 Peter 2, 5, 1 Peter 2, 3, you have tasted that God is good, not just seen, not just some intellectual God is good all the time. That thing, you've tasted it. If you've tasted that God is good, then when God gives you something, it probably tastes pretty good. Because you have a taste for God, you have a taste for the things of God. Now, I look back at Exodus. In Exodus 20, they told Moses, they just cut off their prayer life. They said, Moses, that holy God that's scaring everybody half to death at Sinai, we don't want anything to do with him. We don't want to talk to God. So they were renouncing prayer in Exodus 20, 18 and 19 is what they're doing. We prefer these dumb idols that we've made. They had made a golden calf. So they had cut off prayer. They were not tasting God because they weren't praying. Therefore, they could not taste the goodness of his provisions. I don't know about you, but where that leaves you, that leaves a big void in our lives, and we whine, and we moan, and we accuse, and we gossip. Now, this creates a real problem for Moses. Moses is trying to lead these people. This is a hard day. And Moses is aware that there's something going on besides taste. He's he's aware that there is a purpose for this. There's a storied revelation out here, that they're out in the wilderness. Think of this. 
there, it, it is really, a, it's, I found this the case that uh, I go through spiritual amnesia. Life gives me a blow to my head. I forget who I am for like months. I think before I came to this church, I was in a state of spiritual amnesia. I knew all the stuff. I got a doctorate in theology. I'm a Church of Christ preacher's boy. I can't remember who I am. So I don't know how to behave. I don't know what happened there except some kind of bump on the head. I had some kind of bump that life didn't treat me right, and so I have conveniently forgotten who I am. Now, Moses knows who they, who they are. He knows that they're in the middle of a big story in which God elected to save the world through Israel. He knows that that's the story in Genesis 12. He knows that when Moses was sitting out there 80 years old in the desert, that, that there's a burning bush in Israel. He's called to lead Israel out of Egypt. He knows that the presence of God is literally living in the tent of meeting in the, in the, uh, the community there. God is present. He knows there was a covenant made to Israel to never quit, Exodus 19. He knows that God gave commandments to guide people and help them become godly in Exodus chapter 20. He knows that a community of God's people has been created for the purpose of witnessing to the nations, to be a light to the nations. And he's focused on these big things, and they're concerned about cucumbers and garlic. That's, I think these people were nuts until I think, well, it kind of sounds like me sometimes. I don't like cucumbers and garlic that much, but they did. And you know what? They were willing to go back to bondage to escape a difficult place because they had no sense of their purpose, their calling, who they were. I want you all to understand deeply who you are. Something bigger than the Lake Collins Church, something bigger than me, something bigger than this address. Moses is, a, is called to be an overseer. That's what elders are called in Scripture some places. What that means is he, he has a big vision. He's looking for the purposes of God for all of the people of God all of the time. God needs overseers in churches, and he needed it in Israel, because we come into Christ with our mirrors. I'm not really looking out the window much at what you're doing. I'm concerned about me. In fact, I'm probably taking a selfie of me frequently. So it's pretty tough to be an overseer if you've got a mirror or a selfie going all the time. And he's attempting to lead them to be their overseer. The people are looking at their mirrors, their own reflection. It's hard out here. Or they've got a very small porthole in which they can see a few people, and they're concerned about them, but not the bigger picture. So there's no identity here except the mirrors and the selfie. This is the struggle that that church had. It became about needs, wants, and feelings. Someone has said that those are the, that's the trinity now in America. Needs, wants, and feelings are way bigger than you. They're way bigger than the United States than the Father, Son, and Spirit. Way bigger. In fact, we, we, we would think that the authority of God is in our feelings. More than anything today, I just call you to take a deep breath and access the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. Because we're in a crazy culture, and that culture impacts on churches, can tear them apart. It's either going to be the big me on the selfie, or it's going to be humility before the Father, Son, and Spirit. That's what happens in churches. In 1 Peter 1, verse 2, you go to the New Covenant. Paul's writing, I mean, Peter's writing a letter in 64 AD to churches that are about to be persecuted by Nero, who is a terrifying, violent dictator. And the, 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 the persecution's breaking out. He writes it to little house churches established by Paul 16 years ago. So this is in, now, in what's now Turkey. He reminds these people who are going through suffering 
who are going to go through suffering of who they are. They're on the way. They need help. And here's what he says. In 1 Peter 1, do we have, I'll just, I'll just read, do we have verse 1? I don't know if we do or not. Let me read one, and I'll pick up with, with 1 and 2. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to God's elect, exiles scattered throughout the provinces of Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, who have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through the sanctifying work of the Spirit to be obedient to Jesus Christ and sprinkled with his blood. Grace and peace be yours in abundance. He tells these folks who are out there on the way in a very dangerous wilderness in 64 AD, you are God's elect. He had you in mind from the foundation of the world. This is big picture stuff. We got to have big picture stuff to live the details of a local church. It's the big picture stuff that feeds us from heaven, that gives us the power to go through uncertainty. You're scattered on earth, but that doesn't mean you're weak. That does not mean you're weak. Number three, you're exiles, and it literally means you're aliens. You're weird. My mother, one of the best things my mother ever did was she said, you're peculiar. Little Jimmy, you're, you're peculiar. I said, what? Yeah. What's that mean? You've been set apart for the purposes of God in this culture in Pueblo, Colorado, and, and people are going to say you're weird all the time, and that's okay. You're in exile. This, this, because you're not in exile from God. He loves you. You're in exile from the culture you live in. They're going to say little Jimmy Reynolds is weird at church, at, at school. They even did a church. <laughs> That's fine. Because I'm not trying to be peculiar, but when I gave myself up to God, he said, I want you to be different. Because the culture is going down. I want you to be different so you can help somebody in the culture. I want you to be peculiar, yet I want you to love that culture, that, those people in that world. So he says, you are scattered on earth, you're exiles from the culture. He says you've been elected according to the foreknowledge of God. He's got you in mind from the beginning. And, and what he's doing is he's working a sanctifying work of the Spirit in you. That's what he's saying to this little house church. In other words, the, the Holy Spirit exists to set us apart for the work of God. For the purposes of God, he takes us out of a culture, makes us different in the power of the Holy Spirit, and then puts us back in the culture. I've told a story I'm about to tell at least two or three times, so if you have memory of that, most people don't. Uh, you know, just give me a little break here. But I've been up in the mountains, so I got all these mountain metaphors in my head. And several years ago at Long's Peak, Somebody wasn't, wasn't climbing the dangerous, normal way <laughs> uh, that Glenn, Glenn climbs. Instead, they were going straight up the thousand foot. It's a, there's a thousand foot just straight up, and you have to get an e expert if you want to do it. You have to get an expert to take you. So these two guys at 2 o'clock in the morning take off up the side of the mountain, climbing, and about halfway up, something happens with the expert climber. He's got his client with him, and the expert falls out away from the mountain, and the pull of the rope slams him back into the mountain and kills him. Well, the, the client's out there on halfway up, 500 feet up in the air, stuck. He's totally terrified, just like this, up against the wall. That morning when the sun comes up, people down below who are climbing see him. The, the call goes out to Estes Park. And this is what I'm talking about, of being set apart for rescue. There's some rescuers. There's some champion mountain climbers who come, climb up that mountain straight up, and take that terrified guy off the side of that mountain and save his life. That's what the church is supposed to be doing. These guys have been set apart. I guarantee you the training of those guys, they're not eating junk food down there. 
These guys that can go up a mountain and take a, a basically terrified guy off and everybody get off alive, those people are eating meat. Those people are, are powerful. Those people are skilled. Those people are disciplined. That's what we're about. That's what he's saying in 1 Peter is that we are, we are set apart by the Holy Spirit, not to be weirdly religious, but to be people that love people in the world and go out and help people in the world. We've got something they need. We're set apart for his purposes. And then he says, for obedience to Jesus Christ. You know, for a long time, when I came into this church in 84, I understood grace, but I did not understand that, be, that he has created works for me to do. That there are works that people that have been saved by grace do. And there are works that they don't do. Like I didn't get that I was supposed to be faithful to my wife. I'm saved by grace. Whatever I do in my marriage, he'll forgive me. I don't I think that's cheap grace. Grace is costly. Grace is really paradoxical. It's free, but it's costly. All at the same time. Then I realized, no, I can't do that. And I realized it right in this room. I told that story three weeks ago. That I've been saved to be obedient. I've been saved to be a faithful man. So that's what he's saying in 1 Peter to these people who are living in the wilderness with men like Nero attacking them. In Galatians 5.2, Paul agrees with Peter. He says, one of the fruits of the Holy Spirit is faithfulness. Faithfulness to God. Now, let me, let me just be clear about this. I, I, we live in the world of what the scholars call the ethics of authenticity. You've got to be true to yourself all the time. That is nonsense. I just say that. Y'all aren't saying amen, but that's nonsense. <laughs> so you think the Holy Spirit is giving us the fruit of faithfulness so we can be faithful to ourselves all the time? I think the, clearly he's giving me power and giving, and giving me a fruitful life in the Holy Spirit so that I can be faithful to God when it feels like it and when it doesn't. That has to be. That's what this is about. So that honoring God and being faithful to God is what I'm called to do. You know what? I knew intellectually a whole lot of stuff. I missed that. I thought it was about Jim Reynolds being faithful to Jim Reynolds and what he wanted. And I came close to blowing up my whole life. Galatians 5.22 says, you don't take a selfie picture of yourself and say, I'm going to be faithful to that. No. God reveals Jesus to you and you say, I'm going to be faithful to that. But I need help through the power of the Holy Spirit to do this. This is what we're called to be. See, what I'm really saying to you is who the leader is up here or who preaches most of the time is not the biggest deal in this church and never has been. Moses, man, he, he got run over by Israel. It's about, the, it's about the spiritual maturity of this church. That's always the most important thing. How much have we grown up? That's it. I can tell you it's impossible to lead with people who simply are not mature. And the reason why there's been a lot of fruitfulness in this church is, is there's a lot of maturity here. And that's all, when you, when you read uh, the scriptures, that's where the focus is, is on the entire church in the power of the Holy Spirit, being mature, growing up. Now, churches in Israel that are living out here in the wilderness need strong leaders. You have strong leaders. When I'm not here, you have strong leaders, and you'll have more strong leaders that'll, be, that'll come in, that will become elders in this church. So, and you know what the admonition is? I was looking at that. Because in a culture that believes that you find the truth inside you and you don't find the truth outside you, we don't really have a lot of confidence in the church. We have more confidence in me. That was me. I tell you, when I was, when I was in my carnality, I, I confessed Donna's sins all the time 
and I confess the church all the time, all the messed ups in the church. Just talk about how and trash the church all the time. I found that when the holiness of God came, I was always confessing my sins. And one of the sweetest times of my life was being with Ron Milton, you know, and George and Orrin Hazeltine. And they were shepherding me. The admonition to shepherds in Scripture is this. Be shepherds. Shepherd. It's a dangerous moment in the church. In, in, in Ezekiel, especially in times where there's transition, be shepherds. That's 1 Peter 5, verse 2. In, in Ezekiel 34, God is really upset with Israel's shepherds. Angry about it, Ezekiel 34. He's saying, don't do that. Lead out and suffer in humility when the, it's tough. And you who are younger, submit to them. If they're fo- as they follow Jesus, you follow them. In Acts 20, 28, Paul says, I got I to gotta have one more conversation with the Ephesian elder, elders. So in Acts 20, 28, he, he gathers them around him, and they cry, and they weep because he's never going to see them again. And you know what he tells those guys? He says, be who you are. Be shepherds. There's always more than just a few shepherds in a church, but be who you are. He says there's savage wolves out there that will take people out of your church. Be a shepherd then. Don't run. And there's people that distort the truth inside the church. Be a shepherd. I can tell you that, that that's so crucial for a church to understand the need for that as we all submit to Jesus. All of us. Shepherds submit to Jesus. Shepherds submit to others as well. Two things here in the end. Number one is about the fact that we submit to one another. Submit is not in people's top ten list. Of, I just love to submit. I don't hear anybody talking about that. But I found that Ephesians 5 says, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. In 1984, when I accepted the call that came to me to, to come here and be here, uh, about five or six months later, a guy got up and started making the announcements at the end of church. And I went to the back. That's what you did back then. You wore a tie and all that, went to the back, and all that. And uh, things change, those little things change some. Anyway, I'm not, somebody has me engaged, it calls me outside those doors and talks to me. And I'm back there, and, they, and this guy is up making these announcements, but he hasn't given a closing prayer yet. And somebody suddenly comes up and knocks on that door back there and says, you need to get in here. Because the guy making the announcements, this is like six months after I came here, he wants to talk to you in front of the whole church. He's making the announcements. I'm back there. I'm not really excited about that. Uh, what's he going to do? And so what he does says is this. This is six months after I came here. He says, uh, you know, I was opposed to Jim Reynolds coming here. You know, and he went on about why. <laughs> yeah. And I could tell the church was really tightening up. Because he's talking to me and I'm back there. And they're all overhearing this. And then he says, but you know, after six months, he's really not too bad. (laughs) I mean, it could have been worse. And he kind of just kept on going. And people came up and I got many apologies. Uh, It's like condolences. (laughs) I said, wait a minute. I I, I look at that. I look at that as a kind of a fun day, you know. Uh, that guy, what was he doing? He was talking and he talked a lot. Maybe it wasn't totally appropriate what he was doing. But you know what he was saying? Is I didn't really agree. But I'm submitting to Jesus. And I'm submitting to the Holy Spirit in this church. And Jim's fine. You know. And I never forgot it. That guy is a part of the church of the living dead right now before the throne of God, he gave, he left a legacy for us about big heartedness. And you know, he and I had a lot of conversations that were, that there were, we were disagreeing, but they never even came close to falling out with each other 
Because I think really of the way he set that tone that morning. I did not know this guy. I never had anybody talk to me quite that way in front of the whole church. But that was submission, mutual submission that he did, and we didn't use the word. The second thing I want to talk to you about is conflict. Conflict identifies the treasures, the garbage, and the, and the baggage of a church. You talk to people that, dis, that agree with you all the time, you're not going to get even close to the full truth. Uh, Daley Quavey talked to us recently about you need to have conversations with people you disagree with. I have found that to be the case over 33 years of discussing everything. Take the issue of the Holy Spirit in 1984 and begin talking about that or talking about what Irvin wrote a lot about, about worship. What is worship? Man, there were lots of feelings about that. But you know what happened is a lot of dialogue back and forth, conflict. We all acknowledge Jesus Christ as Lord. But the conflict is, I, I, this is my, I'm going to listen to you first, and you're going to tell me what you think, and then tell me how you got there, and I'm going to respect your views, and you're going to respect mine, and I'm going to talk to you about how I agree and how I don't agree, and we are going to embrace before we leave. We're going to ask the Holy Spirit to come on us, and that's the way we're going to operate and if we do, I've found every time that that's happened in my life, I learned something from you. Always. That I had a little view of it, but I needed that conflict. One of the beautiful places in the New Testament where this happens is Paul rebukes Peter for refusing to eat with the Gentile Christians when his Jewish brothers were there. He does that, and he mentions it in Galatians. It happens in about AD 49. In AD 64, when he writes 1 Peter, you can see his love for Paul. He loves him. They have worked through their conflict under the lordship of Jesus. They've gone out and, and changed the world. And, you know, Peter at the end, he says, you know, I love Paul. Basically, I won't go into all of it, but he's, I love Paul. He said, but I, I find that some of the stuff he writes is really hard to understand. But I love Paul. That's Peter talking. Those kinds of conflictual situations, I think, bring us together. The people that I have had disagreements with, and we have worked those through to the other side, are the people in this church and in churches before this that I feel closest to because we simply have shared our life together. So I call you here, we just, at, at, the, at the close of this, I just say, you know, there's things that God is calling us to, unity, prayer, obedience, submission, and conflict inside unity and prayer. Speak in the truth in love. So the Lord bless you and bless you as you, as you live your life and you live your life here together. Would you all stand, please? I just want to pray for us all right here, right now. Just ask for the Holy Spirit. Some of us are just learning about these things. I got a 14-year-old grandson that uh, wants, he's, wants me to teach him how to drive, but whenever he, I'm in the car with him, he breaks the law. You know, and he's like, it's 30 miles an hour, Paxton. He's going 40. Isn't it? Paul, you know, I like, I like it. Eh, okay. But uh, I'm not going to be in the front seat much longer here. We got to slow this thing down. We've got to submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. We need to pray. We need to grow. How is it that you are personally going to grow? How's that going to happen? Don't even think about any of the decisions. How are you growing right now? God, help us to look out big windows and see your purposes and see all the people of God. I think of all the people I've known, done church with, loved, disagreed with, hung in with all these years. Jesus Christ is Lord. He's going to take care of this church. He doesn't need us telling him what to do. Help us, Lord, just to slow it down. 
We're on a high mountain and the oxygen level is low. Help us to slow down, breathe, seek you, and ask you for blessing through this transition, Lord. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed this church with every spiritual blessing in Christ. Even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless in his sight. Bless us, God. Help us to know how high and wide and deep is your love. Give us a spirit of wisdom and revelation so that we may know you better. Help us not to take any more selfies, but help us to see. Give me vision, Lord, to see also in my life and what you have for me. I praise you for the unity of this church. I praise you for the DNA in this church. Thank you, God, for what you do in these folks. Bless them today. And bless them forever, Lord. We pray in Jesus Christ's name. Amen.